The Strange Case of Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde. This is a literature short. These are short videos to revise each chapter of Jekyll and Hyde. And in this video, we're going to look at chapter eight, The Last Night. We will look briefly at the events of the chapter and then some of the language used. This is a longer chapter than the last few, so I will try to keep the summary relevant and concise. Let's move over here now to look at the events. At the start of this chapter, Utterson receives a visit from Poole, Jekyll's butler. Poole reports that Jekyll has shut himself away in the cabinet. Remember, the cabinet is Je Jekyll's laboratory. Poole says that he suspects foul play and asks Utterson to accompany him to Jekyll's house. When they arrive, the servants are huddled together like a flock of sheep. They're clearly distressed. A maid is crying and even Poole seems on edge. Utterson and Poole make their way through to Jekyll's laboratory. They knock on the door and listen carefully for the response. When it comes, both men agree that Jekyll's voice seems different. Poole believes that Dr Jekyll has been murdered and that there is somebody else in his laboratory. Poole tells Utterson that all week the person inside the laboratory has been leaving notes on the stair outside the room, giving instructions for purchases from chemists. Whenever Poole purchases each order, it's left out again, with instructions to return it, and with a comment that what Poole has purchased is not pure. One note reads, find me some of the old. Poole explains to Utterson that he saw whoever's in the laboratory once, that this person was masked and much smaller than Jekyll. Poole is convinced by this point that Jekyll has been murdered. Poole then swears that the figure he saw is Mr Hyde. They call for Bradshaw, Jekyll's footman. A footman is a type of male servant. And Utterson explains that they plan to break into the laboratory. They instruct Bradshaw to stop anybody who might try to escape out the back. After five blows of the axe, they break through the door into the cabinet. The fire in the room was burning, the kettle was boiling, and in the middle of the room lay the body of Edward Hyde. Utterson knows immediately that this is the body of a self-destroyer. That is, he has committed suicide. It is clear that nobody is left by the back door. The lock is rusted, and although it has been broken, the fractured pieces are rusty too. They look around the laboratory and find a sealed envelope addressed to Gabriel John Utterson. The envelope contains Jekyll's will, which has been changed and is now made out to Utterson. The envelope also contains a note dated with that day's date. This note directs Utterson to read a third document from the envelope, which is the account of Dr Lanyon. The men part ways. Utterson returns home to read the contents of the envelope. He tells Paul that he will return before midnight when they will then call the police. It's there that the chapter ends. Let's move over here to look at some of the devices and techniques employed by Stevenson. This chapter is an apt reminder to consider the ways that Stevenson uses the surrounding environment to really create a sense of all-encompassing fear. We're told that it was a wild, cold night and that the moon was lying on her back as though the wind had tilted her. Even something with a presence as constant as the moon is blown over by this aggressive wind and the wind makes talking difficult. The clouds, described here as flying rack, now, this term is very archaic. It's a very old phrase for high clouds. And Stevenson writes that these clouds are diaphanous and lawny. They're patchy, thin and broken up. And when you're writing about these descriptions, it's important that you consider that this is more than just a spooky description. The moon has been knocked back. The clouds seem damaged. And then we learn that the streets are deserted. From the sky to the ground, everything feels ominous and uneasy. Stevenson writes that Utterson feels a crushing anticipation, so the reader understands that the foreboding atmosphere is felt deep within the characters too. Even the trees are lashing themselves. We're given an image of trees acting with intention here. They're personified and we're left with this overarching atmosphere of tension and discomfort from the moon to the clouds to the trees and of course in the innermost part of Utterson. When he mops his brow, it's the moisture of this strangling anguish, and even his voice is harsh and broken. It's important to remember too that this is even before he's reached Dr Jekyll's house. 
This anguish and atmosphere of terror continues within Jekyll's house. You will have studied how the servants are described here as huddled together like a flock of sheep, and how the housemaid broke into hysterical whimpering. However, as Poole and Utterson reach the cabinet, Utterson says that this is a strange tale, and a wild tale, and one that won't hold water. If something won't hold water, it means it will be easily discredited, as though the story itself has holes in it. Yet, and these kind of links are really important when you're studying whole texts, shortly after this, Utterson attempts to claim that this is a plain and natural tale. This apparent contradiction gives us a sense of the inner wranglings of Utterson's character. He wants to be the stable and neutral party, able to narrate our story with rational thought and reason. And yet none of this really makes sense. This is a common theme. It is impossible for the reader to pin down Hyde. We never have anything definite by way of physical description. And Utterson's inability to reconcile these inexplicable ethereal events really indicates how this sense of mystery permeates its way through every part of the novel, even to Utterson, our logical and calm lawyer. The last thing I want to look at before we finish is the reference to doors in this chapter. So I'll move over here to look at this. Now, Doors are referred to all the way through the novel. I did a quick search before recording this, and they come up 59 times throughout the whole novel. Now, we can't always assume that frequency correlates with significance, but sometimes these doors are important. After all, it's the door in chapter one which really triggers the story to unfold. You might interpret these doors in a number of ways, but for me, the doors in this chapter really seem to indicate enlightenment and revelation and sometimes barriers to knowledge and understanding. Sometimes they indicate the threshold of a new development, and sometimes they show a clear divide between people, worlds and concepts. After all, we know that duality runs through the whole novel. This chapter, the very last direct account of Utterson's before all is revealed by Lanyon and Jekyll, starts with the door being opened on the chain, so just a small opening of understanding as Utterson makes his way towards the truth. The servants turn towards the inner door with faces of dreadful expectation, for they are trapped in this closed space of fear and confusion. You will have read that Utterson places his hand on the red baize of the cabinet door. Baize is a fabric. We still use it today on snooker tables, pool tables, card tables, and we no- it's normally green, but here it's red baize. Now the context will help us to understand the significance of this, for in households rich enough to have servants in the uh, 19th century, baize was used on doors which separated the servant quarters from the main household. Behind the baize doors, all sorts of noises and smells and things which an upper class household would not want contact with took place. So the baize door here symbolises that kind of divide. Behind this red baize door is where the unseemly and gritty actions took place, away from the respectable social circles that Dr Jekyll moved in. Utterson's hand is uncertain on this door because he knows that he is about to enter a horrific underworld of whatever Jekyll has been hiding. Paul, too, explains that they have had nothing from Jekyll that week, nothing but papers and a closed door, and this really epitomises his legacy for those around him. He was a closed door in many ways, and all they have left of him before death is just this, a closed door. For the readers, we are given this striking image of this closed door, but also the papers which feel very right, very fitting, for after all, this is an epistolary novel, made up of letters and papers to bring together the dark and disturbing narrative of a dual mind. We'll leave it there. I'll be back soon with the next chapter, Dr Lanyon's narrative, and until then, goodbye and thanks for watching.